Shalom from Israel to all of the Daystar viewers around the world. I'm Moshe Bartzvi, the producer and founder of Israel Now News. We at Israel Now News are dedicated to bringing you the full story and the truth about Israel from Israel. It's written in the Holy Bible when David said in Psalm 25:5, Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. And God says in Zechariah 8:16, These are the things that you shall do. Speak out the truth to one another. Judge with truth and judgment to peace in your gates. And always search for the truth, and the truth shall set you free. John 8:31. I hope you enjoyed the program. God bless you from Jerusalem. Shalom, shalom. Welcome to Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rome. And I'm Erin Viner. In our top story, U.S. President Barack Obama has threatened to abandon Israel. Ahead of their meeting at the White House last week, Obama gave a forceful interview, clearly challenging Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Ignoring completely the Palestinians' policy of terrorism, their unreasonable demands, and their refusal to recognize the very existence of the Jewish state, Obama harshly ridiculed Israel for building homes for its citizens in the Promised Land. He asked the Israeli public if they planned to permanently occupy the biblical heartland of Judea and Samaria, and he accused Prime Minister Netanyahu of not being willing to make peace with the Palestinians. Obama concluded that if the talks fail, America may not be able to protect Israel. He said that the fallout could include international boycotts of the Jewish state, isolation, and possible sanctions. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu held his ground in meetings with President Obama, insisting that Jerusalem wants a lasting peace deal, but that the Palestinians are not true partners for peace. Netanyahu pointed out that the 20 years since Israel entered the peace process have been marked by unprecedented steps taken by Israel to advance peace, but have received suicide bombings, rockets fired on cities, and incessant incitement against the country from the Palestinians. He added that while Israel has been doing its part, he regretted to say that the Palestinians have not. And what Israel wants is peace, a real peace, and not a piece of paper. The Prime Minister said that in order to have an agreement, Israel must uphold its vital interests, and that he has proven that he does so in the face of all pressures and all the turmoil, and will continue to do so. Netanyahu had hoped that the meetings with the Obama administration would focus on the looming Iranian nuclear threat, but the White House instead chose to focus on current negotiations with the Palestinians. As Russian forces moved into Crimea, the Jews of Ukraine said the danger of anti-Semitic attacks is increasing. Last week, the Director General of the European Jewish Community sent a letter to Israeli leaders urging them to save the Ukrainian Jewish community. The Jewish official believes the recent violence in Ukraine has left the Jewish community vulnerable to anti-Semitic attacks. Since the unrest began, two prominent rabbis have been threatened, a synagogue was firebombed, and anti-Semitic slogans were used to deface a Jewish sculpture. Rabbi Menachem Margolin wrote that so far there has been no response to community reports which indicate an alarming and increasingly violent trend of hatred toward Jewish targets. He said the challenge is clear. The State of Israel must help with security measures for what has become a Jewish emergency in Ukraine. The late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. would have been a staunch supporter of Israel. This according to King's former lawyer and trusted confidant for many years, Dr. Clarence B. Jones, who says that quotes from the civil rights leader have been taken out of context and twisted to claim that King would not have supported the Jewish State of Israel. He said that Dr. King viewed the Jews as natural allies with African Americans in their struggle against racism and intolerance, and that now is the time for every African American to come forward and stand with Israel in the alpine chill of winter to show that they are wintertime soldiers. Syrian Christians have agreed to the change of tzimitude rather than face death by Al-Qaeda. Tzimi status historically refers to the inferior class of non-Muslims living in an Islamic state. Last March, when Islamic militants took over the Syrian Christian town of Raqqa, the villagers were given three options, to convert to Islam, 
to remain Christian but pledge submission to Islam or to die. Knowing full well that the Muslims were prepared to slaughter the entire community, the Christian leaders signed a submission document which forbids the practice of Christianity in public. The treaty stipulates that Christians must pray and read scripture indoors only so that Muslims passing by cannot hear the verses. Christians cannot wear crosses or any religious symbols and they must pay a special tax for their servitude. The Christian leaders also had to agree not to renovate churches and monasteries in the area. The document concluded by saying that if the Christians disobey any of the conditions, they are no longer protected and the Islamists can treat them in a hostile and warlike fashion. Israeli embassies around the world are on high alert for possible terrorist attacks after Hezbollah vowed retaliation for an airstrike on a weapons convoy in Lebanon last week. Israeli officials have not made any comment regarding the strike, which destroyed a shipment of surface-to-surface -surface missiles and reportedly killed several high-ranking Hezbollah terrorists. In a statement released on its website, Hezbollah called on its Palestinian brethren to renew the terrorist war against Israel and for all Palestinians to join the fight against the Zionist enemy. An Egyptian court has officially banned the Hamas terrorist organization. Hamas, an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood, supported former Egyptian President Mohamed Morsi, who was ousted last July. Since then, tensions between Hamas and the military-ruled Egyptian government have dramatically increased. Egypt accused Hamas of supporting al-Qaeda terrorists in the Sinai who have been attacking tourists, civilians, and the Egyptian military. As a result, Cairo ordered the destruction of smuggling tunnels into the Hamas-controlled enclave of Gaza, a move which nearly crippled its already struggling economy. In the latest step meant to damage Hamas, an Egyptian court ordered the closure of Hamas offices in the country, and according to an Egyptian judge, all Hamas work and activities have been banned from Egypt. Angry lawmakers in Jordan are threatening to cancel the peace treaty with Israel following a debate at the Knesset about extending Israeli sovereignty over Jerusalem's old city. The Muslim Waqf Authority controls the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound, including the Temple Mount, and heavily restricts access to non-Muslims to the site. Prayer by any non-Muslims is forbidden. Christian and Jewish leaders have called on the Knesset to review the status quo and increase their access to the holy site. The Knesset discussion of a private member's bill prompted 47 Jordanian members of parliament to also recall the Jordanian ambassador to Israel. Meanwhile, Palestinians spewed anti-Israel rhetoric and rioted in the area, injuring several Israeli police officers by pelting them with rocks. The Jerusalem municipality came under fire last week by angry Muslim leaders when it announced plans to investigate claims of noise violations from mosques. The residents of Jerusalem say they are plagued by early morning Muslim calls to prayer amplified on speakers throughout the holy city. Israel does not enforce noise violations against Muslims for the call to prayer out of respect for their religion, but some Israelis insist it has gone too far. They say that despite repeated requests to lower the volume, they are jolted awake every morning at 4 a.m. by screaming calls to prayer. They claim that the speaker volume is turned up so loud that they are unable to return to sleep because the prayers, which are supposed to be held simultaneously in mosque, are in fact held in succession, one mosque after the other, giving them no rest. The Jerusalem municipality announced last week that it will dispatch a task force to measure the noise levels of 200 mosques within the city of Jerusalem. Despite the municipality's extreme caution in broaching the subject with the Muslim community, the Grand Mufti fired back and attempted to incite the Muslims by saying that this is an attempt to assert Jewish authority over Jerusalem. Mohammed Hussein, who holds a record for inciting the Palestinians to violence, accused Israel of targeting the Muslim population. Another Palestinian leader said that the municipality's plan to keep the peace is actually a plan to attack Islam and its followers. Legislation continues to be drafted, further granting individualized status to the Christian community of Israel. We reported last week on the historic passing of a law affording Christians representation on the Advisory Committee for Equal Opportunities in the Workplace. Muslims, who have long abused the Christian population of Israel, came out against the legislation, 
saying that the government is attempting to drive a wedge between them and the Arab Christian community. After years of harassment by Muslims, Christian Arab leaders are aligning themselves with Israel by calling on their youth to enlist in the IDF and to become active members of Israeli society. This has generated further persecution and violence from which the state is working to protect them. Knesset member Yariv Levine said that the bill is just the first step in a series of laws that he's drafted to give Christians special recognition in the Israeli government. One such law, he said, will allow Christian Arabs to register their nationalities as Christian rather than Arab. He added that programs to encourage community members to serve in the Israeli army are also in the works. There are currently 300 Christian Arabs who volunteer to serve in the IDF, with an additional 430 young women who volunteer for national service, representing a two-fold increase over last year. Many predict that the number of those who serve is likely to double again in the year to come. The Israeli Defense Ministry has successfully tested a highly sophisticated missile defense system for commercial airliners. The tests, which were said to be 100% successful, included the firing of live missiles on passenger planes equipped with the new system. The technology, developed by the Israeli Defense Ministry, the Israel Airports Authority, and El Beit Systems, is able to detect missiles and force them off course with a laser beam. A spokesman for the Ministry of Defense said the live fire experiments were some of the most complex and sophisticated ever carried out in Israel. This system is considered the most advanced of its kind in the world and will provide ultimate defense to planes. It combined advanced detection and disruption technologies and meets the stringent requirements of commercial flights. The defense systems are said to cost about $1 million per plane and are to be installed on Israeli airliners flying what the Defense Department considers to be sensitive routes. That concludes the news portion of our show. Stay tuned for Ask the Source with Josh Reinstein. Hello and welcome to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein, and we're here in a beautiful day in Jerusalem on our rooftop studio. My guest today is John Taylor, president of Voice of Hope radio station. John, thank you for being on the thank show. Thank you. It's good to be here, Josh. Thank you. John, tell our viewers a little bit about what is the Voice of Hope radio station. Well, the Voice of Hope was founded back in 1979 in a place called South Lebanon uh, during the war. And it was founded by a man by the name of George Otis, who was my father-in-law. And George, at the uh, request of Menachem Begin, went up to South Lebanon and met with uh, Major Saad Haddad, who was then the leader of South Lebanon, and to, to see how the Christian community in, in North America, America, could help uh, the Christians uh, during this war. And uh, they decided the best course of action was to provide a radio station that would encourage the people. And uh, they called it the Voice of Hope. And it went on the air and w uh, broadcast in uh, South Lebanon for many years. Uh, in the last decade, Voice of Hope was actually shut down in South Lebanon. Why was it closed? Well, in 1979, we signed on the air and we broadcast in 1985, we were blown up by Hezbollah and we moved the station to the DMZ zone closer toward Metula, between Metula, Israel, and Marjayoun, uh, Lebanon. And we were there until year 2000 when Israel withdrew from uh, Lebanon. Uh, then our mission completed at that time. We, we left with Israel uh, at that time. We see in the Middle East and every other country the Christian community continues to decrease in the Middle East, yet in Israel it increases. Why do you think that is? Well, I think it's because Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. They value freedom of religion. And so in a place like Jerusalem, you see not only the Jews, but the Christians and the Arabs as well, the Muslims as well, and uh, that they can live uh, together in harmony. But I think the value of uh, the freedom of religion uh, is here in Israel, and this is why. You know, the Christian community is under attack in unprecedented numbers in Lebanon, in Syria, in Egypt. Do you ever think of bringing back the Voice of Hope radio station to give hope to those people? Yeah, that's a really good question. We've been praying about that, and we would like to bring back the Voice of Hope. It might be the time to reinstate it. Uh, there are over four million people uh, from Syria displaced into Jordan and Lebanon. 
Several hundred thousand people have been killed, many of those because of their faith in Christianity. Uh, this is a time to support the Christian community. It's a time for Christians across North America to support the Christian community in the Middle East. You know, we see uh, on mainstream media not a lot of coverage of what's happening to Christians around the world when they're being incredibly persecuted. Whereas in Christian media, we see a lot of that uh, being taken to the forefront. Why do you think there's this, this wave of just ignorance in the mainstream media? Well, there is a disparity. I, I don't think the, the story is being told. I think that's the value of us talking today, Josh, is that we can uh, talk about what's happening here in the Middle East and that Christians are being persecuted for their faith. It's a time for pray, to pray for them, but it's also a time to support them in humanitarian ways, but also to, uh, to pray for them, to support the churches. There is an indigenous church here and it should be supported. Voice of Hope is now thriving in America and in Spanish-speaking countries. Can you tell us a little bit about that? That's right, Josh. The, the Voice of Hope out of Los Angeles, uh, KVOH, is a radio station that was founded by my father-in-law, George Otis, uh, as he wanted to reach the Latin population throughout, throughout all the Americas, specifically Cuba, Mexico, Central and South America. So today it's broadcasting on shortwave and reaching a whole continent with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, there are literally tens of millions of people watching this show. What message do you have for our viewing audience? Well, we're here in Jerusalem. This is a time to come to Jerusalem. It's a time to support Israel. It's a time to support the Christians in the Middle East, too. Thank you, John, for being on the show. And thank you for tuning in to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein. Now back to the studio. This is Jerusalem, Israel's capital city. It's an ancient and modern treasure that is beyond belief. There's a little bit of Israel in all of us. Come find the Israel in you. Up next, Shining Light from Israel. Israel is, by many measures, the, the country relative to its population that's done the most to contribute to the technology revolution. Now, when you look at the NASDAQ, companies are listed from around the world. There's one country, though, that truly stands out, and that is Israel. If you go to the Middle East looking for oil, you don't need to stop in Israel. <laughs> but if you go looking for brains, for energy, for integrity, you know, it's the only stop you need to make in the Middle East. For over 60 years, Israel has been at war, the target of terrorist attacks, and boycotted by many of her neighbors. Yet somehow, during this same time, she has built a nation, transformed an arid wasteland into an agricultural miracle, and evolved into one of the most technologically innovative countries in the world. How did a nation of seven million manage this transformation? Mayor Brand runs Google's Israel operation. The foundation of Israel itself could be seen as an as a entrepreneurial project. Uh, the pioneers who came to build Israel from scratch, they are real entrepreneurs. They took a huge risk. They came to a place that doesn't have much natural resources, that there are a lot of threats from the outside but they still had a great vision in building a successful country, which means that from the foundation of this country, people were already experienced in risk-taking. As president of one of Israel's premier science research institutions, Daniel Zajman thinks part of the explanation is deeply embedded in Jewish culture. We are allowed to ask questions. We are allowed to discuss it. This is very unique, in fact, to the Jewish religion. A willingness to challenge conventional wisdom distinguishes Israel's approach to science. For many scientists, what is on the paper and has been published must be the truth. For an Israeli scientist, what has been published is something that might still question and maybe push further. Israel has this intense penchant for constantly questioning and debating and challenging, which is essential for any innovation-based economy. Dan Senor is co-author of Startup Nation, 
Israel's Economic Miracle. Some of the factors that have been key to Israel's economic success, the role of the military. Almost every single Israeli goes through a leadership experience at a very young age. They're taught at age 18, 19, 20 years old what it means to lead, what it means to improvise, what it means to be entrepreneurial, albeit out in the battlefield. Civilian R&D spending. Israel spends the highest percentage of its economy compared to any country in the world on R&D. Israel has cutting edge policies on immigration and assimilation. There are over 70 nationalities represented in Israel. The rapid integration of these immigrants through an aggressive Hebrew language immersion program has ensured they participate in Israel's innovation. If you look at the Soviet wave of immigration, 750,000, tens of thousands of those had these remarkable degrees in mathematics and science. It was just a huge influx of technological talent. This talent has fueled more startups than anywhere outside the Silicon Valley, bringing the world's leading corporations to Israel for their top R&D talent. And this economic engine has in turn strengthened the young nation. If you describe Zionism as having a prosperous, strong Jewish state in Israel, obviously the high-tech sector goes hand in hand with that. But Israel isn't just innovating for its own ends. A lot of the innovation that comes out from Israel changes the lives of people all over the world, whether it's in irrigation and saving water, smart use of energy, space investigation, nanotechnology, green technology. The world has a lot to learn from Israel, especially at a time when there is so much yearning for an innovation-based economic strategy. For me, Zionism is not only about the prosperity of Jewish people in Israel, but also Jewish people bringing more prosperity to the world. Anywhere else, this would be a vacation by a lake. But this is the Sea of Galilee. The wonders of Israel are beyond belief. There's a little bit of Israel in all of us. Come find the Israel in you. Please stay tuned for the ICEJ report from the International Christian Embassy, Jerusalem. When Israel was established in 1948, it was exactly as the prophet Ezekiel foresaw. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will cause you to come up from your graves, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. Israel literally arose from the ashes of the Holocaust, one of the greatest miracles in human history. Still today, there are some 200,000 Holocaust survivors which still live in Israel. According to the Israeli government, there are still one-third of them who are in need and live below the poverty line. Over the past three years, the Lord placed a unique opportunity before the International Christian Embassy to help those heroes who survived the darkest chapter of Jewish history. In December 2009, the aid department of the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem, ICEJ aid, was approached by Shimon Sabag, the director of the social welfare organization Yad Ezra Lehaver, who was looking for support for a special project. Having been shocked to see Holocaust survivors coming to his soup kitchen for food, he realized that there was a distinct need and began a project to house 14 survivors in the building next door to the offices of the organization. When we were actually approached by the organization at Ezra Lechaver in Haifa uh, for Holocaust survivors, we somehow knew when we visited the project and visited the director that we had stumbled on something very unique. The project was very unique, there's nothing like it in the land, and also the organization itself had a proven track record. And we just knew that we had to uh, start working with them. 
Thanks to the generous giving of faithful Christian supporters worldwide, the ICEJ has assisted Yad Ezra Lehaver in achieving what was once just a dream, a neighborhood of multi-dwelling facilities able to provide practical care and a comfortable and safe home for more than 100 Holocaust survivors. When I actually first met him, Shimon had a, a great heart and lots of dreams, but his vision for this place was at the most to maybe house 20 people. And we started on this together, not knowing what would happen, and seeing in the end this amazing street full of buildings. The Haifa home for Holocaust survivors has captured the attention of the Israeli press and a number of Israeli leaders and dignitaries. At ceremonies marking the stages of completion, the attendance of senior government officials and leaders has given voice to the need to assist these individuals who have suffered so much. In the past year, the Haifa home dedicated a synagogue on its premises to provide a place for the survivors to participate in Shabbat services and observe Jewish holidays. The synagogue also provided the opportunity for some of the survivors to have their bar mitzvahs, since many of them were denied this rite of passage due to being interned in concentration camps. The Holocaust survivors are very old. They are from their end 70s into their 90s. And are quite a lot of them who are poor, they cannot live by themselves anymore, and who are lonely. And that's actually why it was so necessary to have a home for them, where they could feel cared for, and they would be able to live their life in security and uh, in a good atmosphere. I didn't expect in my life that I'm going to end up here, quiet, the price is right, I don't have to pay too much. And I'm so grateful to the International Christian Embassy. After all what we went through, they built for us a home where I'm going to spend the rest of my life here. I'm going to die here. and and. Uh, I'm grateful to all the people in the world who are helping us. Please prayerfully consider what you can do in order to stand with us to help those last surviving heroes here in Israel. That's all for this edition of Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rom. And I'm Erin Viner, reporting from our studio in Jerusalem. Please join us again next week for all of your Israel updates.